Hello, everyone. Welcome to our 2.15 p.m. session, uh, where we will be talking about the Conflict Observatory Program and having a discussion with our implementers who are part of that work. I am Susan Wolfenbarger. I am at the US Department of State in the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations in our Office of Advanced Analytics. And I have the uh, pleasure of being the, the grants officer for this program. Uh, so I am joined today by some of the implementation teams from the Conflict Observatory Program, uh, and I will let them introduce themselves in just a minute, but I wanted to start off with some framing uh, information about the program uh, before we dive into uh, what I think is gonna be a really fantastic conversation about the, all the technologies and methods that the, the teams are using to document Russia's war crimes and other atrocities in Ukraine. So the Conflict Observatory Program uh, was one that we designed in CSO actually prior to the invasion last year. And a, a group of us came together to think about what might happen in the coming days and weeks and what we might be able to do to respond to a potential uh, and anticipated full-scale invasion uh, of sovereign Ukrainian territory. And this is really aligns with CSO's mission, which is really to think ahead and to, to, to devise strategies. And we were really thinking about our previous work in the de development of newer technologies and methods and how we could leverage those in that situation in, per in particular. So we we're really focusing on remote documentation methods uh, in this program. And eventually, as it evolved, uh, the focus became that of documenting war crimes and other atrocities. And so the, the Conflict Observatory Program is a cooperative agreement. ESRI is the, the prime on the, the grant, but we have some really fantastic other folks that are gonna be talking to you today. And we're really leveraging commercial and other publicly available data, uh, both uh, commercial satellite imagery and other types of open source information to do this documentation. So we have uh, representatives from Yale's Humanitarian Research Lab, the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, and Planetscape AI, who are here with us today. And Andrew is up on the screen. So far, the team has produced about 19 public reports. You can see them on conflictobservatory.org. And all of the work that's being done by these teams, I think it's really important to note, is following international standards. So they're following uh, protocols, like the Berkeley Protocol for Digital Open Source Investigations, so that any of the work that they are, are doing can be used to support international justice and accountability mechanisms. I think we've probably all seen a lot of the fantastic reporting that has come out from the teams. Um, the, the Yale team put out a report in February on uh, the relocation of uh, Ukraine's children into a variety of locations across Russia. Uh, and we've seen work from the, the Smithsonian team on looting and destruction of cultural heritage sites and the Planetscape AI team is doing some really phenomenal work with AI and machine learning to help us really cope with a scope and scale of documentation that we haven't had to think about uh, before. So I, I'll just wrap up by saying like, we see this as a, it's a capability uh, that we are using in certain ways in Ukraine for war crimes documentation. Uh, but this is, a, you know, as I said, a capability. It could be used in other types of situations. And uh, we're really hoping to be able to apply this innovation in other places in the future. So with that, I am going to move us into our uh, main discussions. So each of the leads from the different groups are gonna give you about five minutes uh, to talk about the work that they are specifically doing as part of the Conflict Observatory. And then we will move into some questions that, that I've already prepared. And definitely I would love for everyone in the audience to think about questions that you might have for the implementers as well. So I were really hoping to have a conversation about you know, the, the work that they're doing, the, the technical documentation, but a lot about the, the difficulties and, and things like um, the trauma that might be associated with researchers and, and all of these things. So um, we're really excited about this conversation today. So I will just kick us off and by virtue of who is sitting closest to me, we'll start with Dr. Katherine Hansen. Thank you, Susan. This is on, right? 
Okay. Uh, it's a delight to be able to join you all. Thank you for, for the introduction. And it's really uh, a pleasure to be able to tell you a bit more about what we do for the Conflict Observatory. Uh, Smithsonian is just one part of the Smithsonian team, uh, is comprised of several different organizations uh, that work, work on documenting cultural heritage damage. And so probably what I should preface this by saying is that we're really a research team. We're comprised of a group of scholars who are focused on doing systematic documentation. Uh, with the purpose of better understanding how and why cultural heritage is being damaged in the conflict. And uh, I'm going to pause for a moment because often I need to explain why cultural heritage might ma matter in a conflict, why this is something that should be documented. Um, and I, I just want to clarify that by saying that it is, it is one part of the fabric of society, and cultural heritage is... is often, particularly for the built and physical cultural heritage, it is... a component that really represents a people, its diversity, its history, um, and its identity. Uh, and so to that end, we are not obviously the first ones uh, on the ground by any stretch, but cultural heritage practitioners are certainly there in crisis and conflict situations documenting what's happened. Uh, there have been war crimes prosecutions for damage to cultural heritage in the past. Um, and one of our goals in this situation is to make sure we're documenting everything to an international standard where it could be used as evidence. Uh, so Smithsonian has a, a group of researchers who interdisciplinary uh, team primarily comprised of anthropologists, archaeologists, art historians, and political scientists. And uh, we have a group from the Virginia Natural History Museum's Cultural Heritage Monitoring Lab who work with us. And then we also have a group from uh, the University of Maryland's uh, International Conflict uh, Studies Program. And those, the academic sides from both, uh, both of our major fields um, put together are really bringing the open source uh, data sets that we have, both the conflict data sets and then the open source information we're able to get, and then our own data set that we're creating uh, of cultural heritage damage events, um, paired with the remote sensing. And so uh, we've, we've had some really collaborative uh, work uh, that we've done with Andrew's team, uh, and uh, we're, we're also bringing in a lot of work with high-resolution satellite imagery and infrared remote sensing. Uh, I think at, at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Caitlin and, and Yale's team. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I just want to reiterate how critical it is that the work that Catherine and her team is doing. The work that we highlighted most recently in our report on the forcible relocation of children to Russia, that really, one of the aspects in that report um, it kind of gets a little overwhelmed by the fact that, you know, children are being taken from their homeland to a new place. And in many ways that they are, in some uh, areas, they're being put into uh, foster home situations. Some are being disappeared through adoptions. Their identities are, in fact, being erased through uh, renaming through their original uh, identity numbers, their Ukrainian identity numbers being replaced with Russian identity numbers, and other measures to essentially try to strip apart the ways in which we might be able to track them uh, from one place to another, make it harder to find them in the future, make it harder for their parents and their families to find them in the future. That in itself is horrifying enough. The really wide scale and systematic event, though, that we tracked. And that's what we do at Yale Humanitarian Research Lab. We document wide-scale and systematic atrocities in war. And the way that we did that was we were looking at the level of what's called re-education. It's really a manner of indoctrination. And that is, at its heart, it's about not just erasing, but replacing culture. You can't do that if you don't understand what it is. And it's actually very hard in many ways to appreciate if you don't have the anthropologists, the political scientists working side by side because they appreciate the depth and the violence of what is taking place better in many respects than others do. So at Yale, 
a lot of our work is done um, in sort of two modalities. Our most forward-leaning modality is to detect, collect, analyze, and document, and securely archive all of this evidence, and we look for all sources of evidence, anything that's open source, by which we basically mean anything we can find that is publicly available. It's unclassified, it's there for anybody to find it, it's often digital, it's out on the internet in some form. Doesn't mean it was originally digital, but it's been somehow captured in a digital format. So somebody may have taken a photograph of a road sign, for example, um, or there's a piece of paper that somebody has scanned. We try to capture all of that, process it, make sure that we then fuse all of that data together in various formats. We also do this with some fairly complex uh, and sort of high-end uh, databases, and that includes very high resolution and to like high medium resolution satellite imagery to make sure that we can place all of that information in time and space, which is crucial. Data is nothing if it doesn't have context. And in doing all of this, our first goal is to make sure that we can support the most like near real time, the most forward leaning decisions that need to be made by policymakers, by civilians, and in that case, by parents who are trying to figure out what to do next. That's the most urgent task. The next most urgent task is to hold the perpetrators accountable for their actions. And that's why, as Susan said, we do all of this to these standards. And it's so important that we know what those standards are in advance so that we can design all of those things with those standards in mind. If we don't do that part, then we may inadvertently destroy key parts of data that can become evidence in courts and in other accountability mechanisms later on. So we have to be very careful about how we do all of this, how we capture it, how we securely archive it. And we are constantly going back over our records, back over our collections and our archives to make sure that we've done it correctly. So that's a lot of what we do um, at Yale. I also just wanted to note before I hand it to Andrew that we're excited to keep this conversation going all the time. I did forget to tweet before we started, um, but you'll find me both uh, individually and at our Yale HRL handle. So we'll follow up with questions for everybody who's following on YouTube. I hope there's more than just my mom online, but hi, mom. <laughs> all right, Andrew, over to you. Hi, um, are you guys able to hear me all right? Great. Um, well, first of all, I want to apologize for not being there. Um, we're a small group out on the West Coast, and because I'm heavily involved in our daily operations, even getting away for 48 hours isn't really feasible with all that's happening. Um, yeah, my name's Andrew Marks. I'm the CEO and Chief Scientist of Planscape AI. Prior to founding the company, I was a professor at the University of Southern California, specializing in spatial computing. And my company is pretty much just me and a small group of my best graduate students. And what we're doing is leveraging advancements in artificial intelligence and high cadence data to inform humanitarian and human rights work worldwide. Specifically for the Conflict Observatory, along with Yale and the Smithsonian, where we collaborate on authoring reports, but um, uniquely we also provide a couple of specialized analytic services. So the first service, um, it's what we call the Destroyed Building Analytic Service. This employs advanced AI and daily commercial satellite imagery from Planet Labs, you know, all commercial data, to automatically detect destroyed buildings across Ukraine. So every day, all buildings in our study area are evaluated by our AI if they're intact or destroyed in CODAs as, as such. This is providing an unparalleled forensic data set of when and where buildings are destroyed throughout the conflict. Um, this analytic service has been crucial in various projects, including tracking the destruction of Mariupol and corroborating eyewitness reports of the bombing of civilian infrastructure. And the second analytic service uh, is the human mobility metric, and this provides a macro level understanding of population movements across Ukraine on a daily basis. The service leverages data from multiple sources to provide a comprehensive understanding of how people move. This has been especially useful in the eastern regions of Ukraine where reliable data on migration is scarce. 
this service has been utilized in several conflict observatory reports, including one with the University of Maryland, which demonstrated that Russia's armed forces are the primary driver of conflict-related displacement, not just the conflict in general. Um, so in order to leave time for plenty of questions, I'll close with that um, and saying that we're very proud of being part of this effort. And I'd like to congratulate Susan for the excellent work she's done in assembling the conflict observatory. Great, thank you. Thank you all for your opening remarks. I have a lot of questions for you um, that I hope will uh, help spur some thoughts amongst the audience. But maybe we'll start with, um, you know, we're talking about your current work, but a lot of this and the reason why you're part of this program is because of your past work uh, in the conflict space. You've been doing a lot of past projects on remote monitoring, on open source documentation and evidence creation. So I thought maybe a, f a first question would be if you could kind of talk about some of the lessons that you learned in your past work and how that uh, really helped in the development of this project. What has changed? I, I know I've been working with you all on and off uh, for more years than we might want to admit right now. And so, uh, you know, some things have changed. So I think, uh, you know, hearing about, you know, how the field has moved is a great starting place for us. And I'm not sure who would like to, to kick us off. Sure. sure. Um, so the first major effort that I worked on was uh, Sudan circa 2011. Uh, this was focusing on how uh, primarily the Sudanese armed forces, which you might be hearing about a lot of in the news again, um, this is like the main military for Sudan and its government, um, was systematically targeting the, uh, mainly the Nuba people, but a variety of different civilian populations of these three contested border states along the border with South Sudan. And just to be clear, these were Sudan's own people. These are not South Sudanese. The thing that was different then was we were working in a very similar modality, sort of near real time, trying to get material out as quickly as we possibly could. For, to give you an idea of how quickly we would put a report out, sometimes we would get satellite imagery in by like 11 a.m. and have a report out by 1 a.m. Uh, the next morning, okay? So that quick of a turnaround timeline. Uh, and they would hit, they were, they mattered, they were, they were getting picked up, they were making a difference. But we barely had guidelines at all for how to do what we were doing. And it wasn't because we didn't look for them. We looked to journalistic best practices for how to do what we were doing with the most ethical possible guidelines. Uh, we looked to, you know, data um, practices in, in academia. We went to our, you know, this was work that was based out of Harvard, so we went to Harvard and we were like, okay, do we need a institutional review board um, to sort of keep us in check or to like, you know, touch base with us from time to time? And they were like, no, you're using open source material and satellite imagery. You're not collecting any personally identifiable information Therefore, nobody can technically be specifically like harmed by what you're doing. And we were like, oh, they can definitely be specifically harmed by what we're doing. That's not true at all. And they're like, yeah, but you can't like make a direct liability claim. So like, you're good. And we were like, oh, this, now I know what data colonialism looks like and it looks like me. Um, so now, all these years later, we, we, we spent the downtime we had after the initial 18 months working on that, kind of going, okay, now that, we, you know, now that we've done that um, in a very scary, like, you know, speeding down the highway at 150 miles an hour with your lights off and it's pitch black outside and you're just hoping you're on the right side of the road, um, mistakes were made. Those mistakes cost lives. I personally hold myself responsible for at least two lives lost and others very severely affected. And that's not because, it's not just because I'm Catholic, 
but it's it, but it's because I know exactly what I did and I know how that information was used to target those civilians. And I'm not trying to beat myself up with it, like it's just the reality. So we do better now because we then spent the better part of the next eight years learning from it, intentionally learning from it, raising money so we could dedicate time to go talk to everybody we could talk to about what we could do better. And then writing about it and documenting all of it, including documenting the loss of life, documenting all the things we should have done differently, and then figuring out how to choose better partners so it wouldn't happen again. That's how you lean into the suck and you do it better. And we'll make different mistakes this time, but we're not gonna make the same ones. Yeah, I, I think very much the same um, in terms of uh, when a lot of this work began, there were not a lot of mm, boundaries, established guidelines, no, no established guidelines, um, and ethical conversations that were really mostly among ourselves. Uh, and I'm gonna just go ahead and date myself. Um, in 2004, when I was working on beginning my work on my dissertation, um, is when I first started using satellite imagery to document damage to cultural heritage sites. And we had, it was the commercially available stuff, it was over southern Iraq, it was horrible refresh rates, right? How often can you actually get that? Um, great resolution. Uh, and, um, and, a, and a real challenge of, of me looking at this and being like, well, I guess I just count these holes now, and I'm just gonna have a bunch of other research assistants count, count things. Um, and the dramatic difference now in having automation of any sort, um, of having, so, so there's, there's the, the, um, the ethical frameworks and the guidelines, and that's been a very big change. And then there's been a huge technological change in what's available. Um, and so when Susan first uh, talked about what conflict observatory would be, uh, I remember you, you sold me on the line that, well, this is what, I'm, I'm building what we would have wanted back in 2014. And I was thinking to myself, wow, well, we wanted everything back in 2014, and we didn't have very much. So this, is, this has been so cool to see. When, when we were working on damage to cultural sites in Syria, um, very little was automated, if anything. Um, there, there were very few guidelines. Uh, there, were, there was also this pressure to attempt to compete with news media. And that's another point that I just want to kind of raise, and I think that we have moved beyond as research groups, um, and I think is, is something that we still struggle with a little bit when we talk to funders, when we talk to, when we talk to media, um, but that we're not in the business of breaking the news. Uh, that's, that's journalists' jobs, and they do that very well. Our job is, is research, and our job is to systematically document the damage in a way that it can be usable. Um, and I think that having that clarity has also, that, that's been really crystallized since you know, we, we started looking at this stuff um, early on and, and has been especially clarified since 2014. Um, I'm conscious of the time and I wanna make sure I give Andrew a chance to weigh in on this one. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I think like the rest of you, um, I did my dissertation using remote sensing looking at Darfur um, and a lot has changed. Um, back then I was using Landsat um, imaging, imaging every 16 days at 30 meters. Um, now we use planet images, which is every day at three meters. Um, so that's the first of three things I think that really changed. The second is the computing. Instead of you know, me running four MacBooks 24-7, uh, now we have distributed cloud-based processing that pushes through tens of thousands of images across all of Ukraine overnight. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, but the biggest thing that has changed, I think, is the audience. It's everyone who's there attending this conference. It's people in government and in international organizations because folks really realize what is possible and are increasingly receptive to new data, new analysis approaches, and new ways to document um, atrocities and other issues. Thank you. Great, thank you all. And I, I really think we can't 
understate you know how much things have changed across the board uh, since a lot of us got our start on uh, in this field so with all of the the technical advances will start there um, that have happened you know Andrew was just talking about you know going from 16 day Landsat 30 meter to daily three meter uh, planet scope we have all of this information at our fingertips now so how are you deciding where you're going to look, where you're going to research? You know, to what extent are the things that we're concerned about in uh, Ukraine documentable with our methods? Um, and so I thought that might be a, a good next piece of conversation to think about. Um, maybe Andrew, do you want to do you want to start with this one? Sure. Um, first of all, I think. And this this is really highlighted in a collaborative report we're working on with Catherine right now. Um, is that um, you've assembled a great team, Susan? Um, I'm not a cultural heritage expert, and so, for example, there's an upcoming report about Donetsk, and we were able to see that it looked like there was some kind of maybe disproportionate damage to cultural sites. Um, but you know, some folks at the University of Maryland. Um, we're able to apply some much more rigorous methods. I was looking, I think, it, I think it's a weighted two-way fixed effect quasi-binomial model with time trends. <laughs> and then the Smithsonian, all their expertise really weighs in on what this means with the cultural buildings. So um, you know, I think for me, I'm just conscious about staying in my lane, doing what we do well, which is monitoring large areas and providing forensic data sets. Um, and then otherwise we work, we make sure we collaborate on any reports that come out. And, and yeah, we, we definitely appreciate that creation of data that you're really serving as the role on, on the team so that you know, the, the other teams have a, a whole nother new set of data that doesn't exist elsewhere to base some of their additional work on. So maybe you all can talk some more about that. Honestly, Andrew, I, I think we haven't, fully taken advantage of the data set that you all are creating, and we're only beginning to scratch the surf surface of what we can do. And a lot of that is because, to get to Susan's point, um, the bulk of what Smithsonian, uh, Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative does uh, for Conflict Observatory or elsewhere is at the request of local partners. So we are investigating, researching, um, providing information, at the, on, on topics that have been requested specifically by our colleagues in Ukraine. So um, the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture and then also um, HERI, which is the Heritage Emergency Rescue Initiative there, uh, as the NGO. And those are the, the two big consumers of what we produce. Um, and so the very first product and product research, paper, series of research papers that we make um, our potential damage uh, reports. So they aren't confirmed. They're things we use based off of NASA's firm's open source, you know, fire detection, infrared uh, remote sensing. And wrote an R script uh, team member did that pulls that uh, daily. So we do a monthly report on uh, an overlay of any cultural site that looks like it's within a one kilometer radius of one of those impacts. And then we have to remove agricultural burning areas, and then often, um, often those become the most important research areas for us because that's our list of potential damage. That's what we then share with our colleagues who can go out on the ground and check. Um, if we're getting a lot of stuff showing up saying these remote areas, which you don't have communication with anymore, look like they're being damaged, we want to make sure you have that information at your fingertips. Um, and sometimes that's working, and, and sometimes that's, that's not uh, as, as useful as it could be. Um, and similarly, we, uh, we have an upcoming report on looting uh, coming out, uh, 12 looting, reported looting events that took place. And we're, we, this is primarily an open source scrape um, of information from our, our data set paired with uh, Russian territorial control data sets and when museums and cultural institutions were looted and when, when they were not and in their location of looting. And um, in that, that request came in both from our colleagues in Ukraine as well as also, you know, there's been a lot of interest from other agencies, specifically law enforcement agencies as well. Um, so we, we primarily uh, take requests from our colleagues in Ukraine, but obviously there's, there's other interested parties who, who 
receive the information as well. Caitlin, was there anything you wanted to? Um, I would just say we also uh, work based, obviously based off of Quest, um, as our colleagues do. The, the other key thing that we factor in though is that we tend to look at our, in terms of narrowing our scope, um, and I'm sorry because there isn't really a way to say this that doesn't sound super creepy, so content warning. Um, we narrow it the way a perpetrator narrows it. We look at civilians, we look at, the, we, we look at what our mandate is, and then we focus in on what are the targets of opportunity the way a perpetrator does. And we look at what's rich, what's available, um, and what is primed for attack. Um, and we look at to see what the indicators are that, that sort of says, you know, this is what's being lined up. The most important thing that we keep in mind as researchers is that atrocities happen in slow motion. They are very, very easy to see coming once you kind of see all the logistics that have to be put into place, especially for mass atrocities. Um, they don't just happen overnight. That I think you, you especially see with our last report where when you look at just, if you just think about the logistics alone, the number of locations that are involved, how big they have to be to house that many children, um, the transit logistics, the identification of the kids, the recruitment involved, how many people had to be involved in that recruitment, how did those people get identified, how were they all communicated with, financing, a lot of effort goes into all that. So when did all of that start in order for all of that to be in place in the way that it did so very quickly as the war was kicking off? That's the kind of thing that then shows you that you actually have to keep going back and back and back before you find the first little strings that you start pulling and unraveling. For... Uh with you, Caitlin and Catherine, and your response just now, you mentioned um, some partnerships. And I think it would be interesting to talk about from each of your all's perspectives and Andrew's as well, the, both the coordination within the team, was, are there interesting things that are coming out that you weren't expecting? And then also a little bit more about, you know, as time goes on, the partnerships that you're forming uh, with folks that are on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, sure. So um, we were talking this morning in a briefing for you guys about how we do social science research. And, um, you know, I, I've done social science research under that umbrella for, for some time. This is the first time we've really done it with an interdisciplinary team. And universities, when I was, was in ac academia, this was something that people gave a lot of lip service to, being great to do. But to actually see it happen on a research team where I have colleagues who are scholars that specialize in very detailed charts that I barely understand, um, and then colleagues that specialize in the art historical content of, well, what would they be taking out of an art museum, and exactly how many, what would you be putting in that many trucks that you can count in that satellite image? And so to catch that range, um, it's been a really useful dialogue, uh, something that I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to hear what they each then contribute uh, and then sort of criticize about what we're, what we're touching on with, with each report. In our most recent report on looting, we don't have a single new satellite image, uh, which I think I never would have as an archeologist, I never would have ever written a report about looting of any sort without a satellite image uh, to back it up. But because we're able to take the open source reporting and the data sets that our poli-sci colleagues are able to analyze, um, we're able to, to um, say something for areas that we don't have imagery for, which has been really, really useful. Um, I think one of the big challenges uh, that goes with that, though, is making sure that we're actually speaking to each other and that we're able to um, be able to share our data and information more broadly uh, in a way that isn't just academic <laughs> and in a way that, uh, in, in this digestible, and in a way that uh, our current report, for instance, our leading report that we have coming up, um, it's a little bit of a Frankenstein of a report because we have two very different methodologies smushed together. And I am hopeful that in future reports, we're going to kind of make this a little more uh, enmeshed, a little more seamless. That's, that's my hope. I don't know, Caitlin, how you guys feel about 
So I'll say that there's, um, there's some great opportunities that we've had, uh, especially working with Andrew and his team on, especially with like widespread and systematic attacks on medical facilities. That's been an incredibly important one. Um, there are some others, uh, there's some other specific research uh, opportunities that we're thinking about on our team, um, but I'm not gonna talk about them because they're good and I'm not letting that cat out of the bag before I have to. Um, I, I don't give away stuff to Moscow <laughs> unless I really need to. Um, I will say that for uh, one of the, the critical sets of partnerships that we're most excited about are those with uh, Ukrainian partners. And frankly, those are some of the folks who are doing the most essential work um, because they have access in the field that we by design do not have. And this is something that often comes across as a criticism of our work, but I really want, like, it's, it's important that we do everything that we do remotely. And also it's really important that we do whatever we can in collaboration with local partners who can do local verification, you know, that verification and field follow-up. Um, we are intentionally not trying to get into their space and we very much welcome those kinds of partnerships wherever we can access them. So if anyone's hearing this and wants to work with us, let us know. Um, but we have, a, we have a few that are coming to, uh, starting to come into fruition that we're very excited about. Andrew, did you have any insights on uh, the partnership that you'd like to share? Um, no, I would just say that within the Conflict Observatory, Smithsonian, Yale, Esri, my small company, we all approach our work from different angles. And we all have very different organizational cultures. But I think the thing that unites us all is we're very passionate about this work. And we find ways to make this happen. And I think. You know, I think we had, we had to start from that position that this was going to work, and then we've been able to kind of figure out how to do it. Great. Um, so kind of pivoting a little bit away from the, the research itself and thinking about the more the idea of what you all are analyzing and documenting and looking at on a, on a daily basis, is a very difficult and heavy topic. And uh, I'm asking this partially for the benefit of the audience because I know somewhat the answer to this one, but you know, it, I think my question is, how are you starting to deal with kind of the, you know, the trauma that you, that you and your research teams might have as a part of doing this type of work? I wish I had an easy answer for this. You want to go first? <laughs> yeah, there, there are no easy answers. That's the, um, that's that's the answer. The answer. Um, there's also, you know, for, I will say the work that's done by places like the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma work, like they're excellent. Um, Columbia does great work on this. That being said, um, I wish there more, were more public listings of great actual therapists that were readily available in everyone's region, cross-referenced by insurance. Like, that, like, that's the practical resource I need for my team, and I don't have it. You know, going through psychology, I'll be, just real talk. I've got a team that's all, that's, you know, we're consultants. I go through personally, I look, go through psychology today trying to find people who can like actually set an appointment with my team who have the skills and the experience necessary for what they are dealing with. And I can't, like I struggle to find that for myself, let alone for all the people with my team and we all, a, a lot of us work remotely. So that's a lot of different places to go looking and there is no one-stop anything for people like us, period. Um, the best thing I can basically find that comes even close to that are services for veterans. And I, th I think if any of you know anything about services for veterans, you know that they were very overtaxed as it is. So that's not really a great answer. Um, we, have, we have to do better at this. The one thing, you know, like, 
we at least thought about it when we thought about building our budget and figuring out how to try and provision some resources for everyone. We have regular sessions as a team to talk about everyone's mental health, to check in with each other, um, and to try at least to make sure that it is understood that your mental well-being is valuable and precious and needs to be protected. And that if that includes you being given you know, a lifeboat to go somewhere else, we will build you that lifeboat that everybody has a future outside of this work, we'll help you find it and make sure that it is a good one for you. So that also has to be part of it. It can't just be like a crash out, you know, because that too is incredibly tra traumatic. And I've, ex you know, I've experienced that myself. But. Yeah, the, there's no easy answer to that question. Uh, the, but. One thing that, actually, I'm going to send you an email about later. Uh, we need to get back in touch with our colleagues from Berkeley, uh, because I do think that they have some materials that they've worked on that, that address this um, a little bit, uh, that, that could serve as a resource. Because there is, as, as Caitlin said, very, very little out there. Um, and particularly for those of us who have junior staff, junior researchers uh, coming up, you want to make sure that you're giving them uh, the support like Caitlin mentioned, um, but also the resources and the tools, because um, it's not, uh, unfortunately, it's not like any of this is going to go away. Uh, so it, it's something that uh, finding, finding a way through it um, is pretty key. I think the other aspect, which you didn't ask about, but I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, say just a word on in terms of safety, is that um, we have gone, as, as scholars, quite uh, around quite a bit about uh, do we want these as scholarly publications where everyone's named? And for our Ukrainian colleagues who have asked to join us in these publications, does the value and the weight of having a scholarly publication outweigh the potential risks that come with it? And that has become a really interesting conversation that, frankly, uh, our approach as the, as the, my approach as the team lead, and, and, and everyone has been pretty much in agreement with this, um, has been that it's up to the individual to decide. Um, so if you as a scholar want to be named on the publication, we name you. Um, and uh, I, th I think that that has been one of the more sobering conversations we've had, certainly, has been, well, of course I want this academic credit, of course, of course I want this because this helps me in my future scholarship, my future job possibilities. And so when we think about collaboration, um, particularly for our colleagues uh, in Ukraine, uh, making sure that if we're, we're citing them, if we're uh, using, if we're, we're asking them to contribute research, that we're able to give them academic credit um, and that we can have, have an accurate conversation also about the risks that are involved. Yeah. But isn't that also an opportunity for us as a sector to try and evolve and say, you know, papers can live indefinitely. Time periods that, like, time can elapse when people can get to safety. Why not have an option for their name to go on it at a later date or when, right, when they have, when they have that option? That's really what we're looking at for our team, which, as you might see, like, there's only Nathaniel and I that are public um, right. for, the, for the CEO at Yale. Yeah, and yeah, we, we face the same question, but I would, love, I would love for you to know all the people who are the lead authors on these reports. It's not us. So I think we disagree on that because we've had a lot of recent experience with both Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, um, where we had a lot of problems with J-1 visas. And the way you get a J-1 visa, you, the way you get somebody out, is for them to have had academic publications. So I think when the rubber meets the road, um, for right now, the way the system works, unfortunately, we have to, we have, to have publication credit out there. Um, so we, we, our teams do it, the approach differently, but um, I agree that it's, it's an area that really has to have some sensitivity. Yeah, and Susan, um, I would just say, just say from our end, um, you know, while much of the work that we do is computational leveraging AI, you know, I have a group of folks that have just finished grad school spending all days looking at cities that have emptied out or craters where buildings used to be. Um, so while we're very mindful of mental health, um, for us, it's really critical that we keep connected to what we're doing, which is trying to reduce human suffering and document atrocities. So it is a balancing act. You know, we, we have to remember why we're doing stuff and we start each of our weekly meetings with 
struggling with the conflict and understand what's happening and the role we're playing to reduce human suffering. So I'm going to ask one more question before I turn it over to the audience. So please think about any questions that, that you might have uh, before we uh, turn to you. So I think just kind of a wrap up question for, for my perspective. What advice would you give to other either individuals or teams that are trying to get engaged in this uh, type of documentation, war crimes, atrocities, human rights violations? What, what kind of advice might you want to give them based on you know, the situation that you guys have all been kind of living in for the past year? I'd say regardless of where you are, any, anywhere in the world, any conflict, any stage of development for you and your team, set your standards, be open to evolving them, but set your standards and then stick to them. The worst thing that I usually see are people who set a standard and then immediately backtrack on them due to usually it's time pressure and they'll buckle under that sense of, well, we have to get it out right now because something is bearing down. I'll tell you what, like that is always going to be true. There's always going to be more time pressure and it will always be in service of you compromising on, on your fundamental principles and usually on principles that are keeping your findings safe and fundamentally your team safe in establishing with accuracy that what you are putting out into the world is meaningful and accurate to the best degree that you can establish it by because it meets your standard. So once you compromise on that, you're, then you're kind of in the weeds. So yeah, whatever protocol you're going by, you gotta, you gotta really just make sure in advance, like set a back plan to it and be like, okay, can we, can we actually get there? I think that's, you know, and for what it's worth, that's, that's really hard. Our own protocols are really hard for us to hit. We're constantly working and coming back to the drawing board and figuring out how to do better. So being open about that, that's, that's fine. That's just part of the process. Um, but, you've, but you do need to try and, and set that to attain to it. I would add that uh, for the advice I would have wanted myself to get to um, is uh, do the do the outreach to both your local colleagues um, who who are there on the ground um, and also the international organizations. Um, even if you have no intention of having long early morning conversations with those international partners over and over again, um, uh, that that knowing the lay of the land, having an understanding of who else um, is working in that area, who then you can contribute towards. Because even if, and this is I think the thing I really wished that we had, eventually we came to it early on, like 2014, 15, but it, it took a while. There can be duplication of effort. Um, funders hate this, but lawyers really like it. Um, so there can certainly be duplication of effort. From a research perspective, your methodology is always going to be a little different than somebody else's. And if what you're doing is replicable, you should be able to have someone else doing something similar, getting a not too dissimilar result. And so uh, there's a, a couple of international organizations that are quite concerned about duplication of effort for cultural heritage documentation and, and others. And um, really, as far as I'm concerned, and I, I wish I could have really told myself this back in the day and to anybody else who's starting out, it's okay for there to be duplication of effort. It, it really is. This is in the end evidence and it all goes towards helping one, one point. Andrew, do you have any uh, last words about uh, any advice for folks? Uh, sure, I think I'll echo what Caitlin said, which is whatever you do, you need to maintain the integrity of what you're doing. Um, the human rights community, especially in academia, is very small. I think we all review each other's papers regularly. Um, and we've all worked together for a long time. Um, so I would say just, you know, be transparent, clear, and whatever you do, do so with integrity because it's um, a small community. 
All right, thank you all so much, and thanks for humoring me with uh, that peppering of questions on all kinds of topics. I want to open it up to others that are in the audience uh, and see what things we might have missed in this discussion so far. Um, it looks like we have someone right here. Um, I'm Ursula knutson Lada. I'm with the Defense Committee on National Legislation, um, the Quaker Lobby. And my question is, we were so excited to see the Conflict Observatory get stood up so quickly with so many fantastic partners gathering all this important data and the conflict in Sudan just reignited and there's crickets. So how do we get this kind of energy, both from the USG to fund it and connect people and get it moving on all the other crises that aren't in Europe. Um, and how do we get this a low enough cost on one hand to make it easily replicatable over uh, many areas, but just the political will as well to spend our money on it. I was hoping I wouldn't get any questions. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, in my opening remarks, you know, I, I did talk about how, you know, this is a, a capability, you know, that is amenable to other conflict situations. You know, I think from the perspective of our bureau, this is something that we would like to be able to, to deploy in other locations. And, you know, I think we've been able to really show in Ukraine and taking advantage of kind of the the, the situation and the willingness of, of folks to focus on it to pioneer and pilot a lot of things that we've never had that space to do in the past. And so, you know, I think that that has been really important for us to get that, you know, you create that first instance of the program. And then, you know, when you have fantastic implementers that are doing this type of research, that are proving you know, that this type of work can happen completely in the open, completely unclassified, then that gives us a space to think about, okay, well, where, where else should we be doing this? Where else can we leverage these things? And, you know, and, and from that point, I think you can kind of you know, take advantage of the resources and the investments that you've already made. And you know, the, the next program doesn't cost you as much because you've, you know, you've already stood up. These, these platforms are, are not cheap to build. Um, and so I think, you know, as you're thinking about additional uh, iterations of, of something like the Conflict Observatory, it becomes easier to, to do that next, that next program. And so, you know, for, for my perspective as a, as a former uh, analyst I, and, you know, the manager of the current program, I really hope that we can find additional ways that we can leverage what we've been able to create in Ukraine into other, other situations. We have a, one in the middle. Hi, um, I'm Kate with Rosm for Ukraine. Um, I was actually curious to hear a little bit about if you've partnered with any organizations on the actual accountability side of things. Um, in terms of uh, using the data that you're collecting to actually work on accountability processes, international tribunals, uh, working on sanctions, advocacy, anything like that. Thank you. Kaylin, do you want to kick us off? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can I say more? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, we are. Uh, so our team, uh, we are in touch with uh, various office, like various offices in Ukraine. Um, so we're well in touch with the Office of the Prosecutor General. That is a, I'm gonna say near daily contact for us at this point. Um, and we're, so we're responding to a number of uh, various inquiries helping to develop um, a number of cases that are in motion. As you know, they have quite a few. Um, so that's, we are far from the only ones who I'm sure are engaged in that. 
Um, but yes, so there, so at the local level in Ukraine, uh, yes. Um, and I think I'll, yes, oh, and um, also, so with OSCE, uh, with the Moscow mechanisms, we submitted, so we responded to uh, Moscow mechanisms one and two. Um, the first one was actually our kickoff report. And we are probably going to be responding, I believe there's been like some m m murmurings um, about the next ones to come out, but that we will almost certainly be responding to once they're announced. Um, for those who are not necessarily familiar, Moscow mechanisms are issued by the country, so that's Ukraine sort of invoking, and then um, we join with the uh, committee of experts to then uh, fully respond and sort of be part of the overarching report. And to toot your all's horn a little bit, you were directly cited in the first Moscow mechanism report with your documentation on attacks on healthcare facilities. So that was a really fantastic lead off report from the Yale team. Yeah. We're not mad about it. <laughs> Did you want to? Hello, I'm, uh, sorry. <laughs> Hello, I'm Saba. I am from Pakistan and I'm a peace linguistics scholar. My, st uh, my research is in peace linguistics. So my question from you guys is, uh, has your organization ever thought about, you know, working on this peace linguistic? That is, let me tell you about that little bit. It is all about like using language peacefully by the diplomats particularly, because it's always the language that, you know, any conflict starts with. And it's always the language in, in terms of negotiations and table talk that the conflict ends up. So like currently I'm doing my research on the diplomatic communication that has been used for, uh, you know, by different countries uh, regarding Taliban regime in Afghanistan. And while I was collecting the data and doing the analysis, I realized that actually the problem is with the language. So um, I just wanted to ask about, or maybe I wanted to add it, uh, add it uh, to your conversation that, what do you think, like your organization has done anything before in this regard or is planning to do anything? Thank you. That is a really important comment, and thank you. Thank you for that. I, I don't think that we have ever looked at that specifically. Um, I can say that the anthropologists on my team would be particularly interested uh, in talking about that more. Yeah, it's as a perspective, it's one that's really important. I will say we're very mindful of our language in our reports and our framing. Um, it's something that we are always very careful about as we think about how our language is going to be utilized by others. We probably take a very, um, a very sort of perpetrator target specific approach in our reviews. So one of our like pre-publication reviews is what we call a red team where we produce an alternate analysis. Basically just imagine that your report is going to be taken apart piece by piece by the worst person possible, um, somebody who is going to fully weaponize it. And then looking at it in that frame, try to imagine, okay, how can I edit this in ways that will help to reduce its weaponization potential? That can be very, that can be very difficult. Sometimes it's a matter of relatively simple uh, redactions or other sort of harm reduction techniques for overall protection. You might notice that like there are certain sources that we redact. We do make those available for journalists and for other researchers who are validated so that we want everybody who needs the data and has a, you know, a reliable per like need um, to gain at full access. But, um, but it is challenging. I think that maybe looking with your perspective in terms of how is this language also advancing peace process would be a very interesting one to use. Hello, 
uh, my name is Maven and I'm with the Halo Trust. Um, we're the world's largest humanitarian demining organization um, and we've been active in Ukraine since 2014. Um, we, are, we have teams on the ground actively demining right now, um, but we're still looking at potential years of harm to civilians from landmines even after the conflict ends. Um, so kind of my question to you is, um, do you anticipate your data collection on these potential harm civilians by these atrocities continuing after like an official cease to hostilities? Um, are you tracking like long-term impacts? realm so we had a project uh, for northern Iraq um, and a, a long-term commitment to working on some cultural sites uh, requested by the Ministry of Culture there and um, demining was our biggest struggle after the cease of hostilities uh, it, it, it really it's a really really big issue at I uh, don't know exactly where we're going to be when when that takes place, but I can tell you that based on our past experience, it's certainly something that we're including as we consider what happens with, with sites on the ground. Andrew, is this one that you're planning on taking forward? Well, Caitlin, you directed that to me? Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, I think if we're able to, if we're able to, um, we'll continue our monitoring large scale of Ukraine for um, anything we can like that. You know, it depends on our mandate um, and the CO, but you know, that's certainly something we're able to do is that kind of large scale monitoring. Yeah, I'd say for our part, our goal is to make sure that our data is as interoperable as possible with efforts like yours so that those who are carrying things forward in a post-war context and redevelopment are basically able, that this is one of the things we're working on right now with actors like Mnemonic and others, to make sure that we're, we're designing the literal databases themselves to be as functional so that no one's having to redo the work, redo the methodology. As Kate said, every time we all do things a little bit different, but if our classifications, if our taxonomies are like enough that we don't have to redo that piece. We're hoping that we can transfer our overall OSINT so that our open source materials is sufficient that we can say, okay, here's everything that we have on mining activity. Here's as granular as we've been able to get it. And you would be able to ingest that in as swift a manner as, as possible. Um, so that even if we didn't have the mandate to continue, other actors would be able to take it forward. Hi, uh, my name is Maddie. I wish I had something more fun and cheerful to ask, but I wanted to ask about sexual violence in Ukraine. Um, I've done a little work with Dartmouth's Political Violence Field Lab, um, and they've been kind of doing little open source work to track sexual violence and find patterns and kind of try to determine causality, um, which has been difficult, obviously, as you know. Um, and so a lot of what you've talked about is kind of tracking and archiving these, um, this data for future war crimes trials to try to hold these parties accountable. And I'm curious, bearing in mind the kind of ethical considerations of this data collection, especially with sexual violence, knowing that this is kind of the most sensitive um, data you could find, do you think that there's ever a possibility of proving that sexual violence could be used systematically or kind of an organized weapon of war? Is the burden of proof kind of too high in what you found, if that makes any sense? Like, would it ever be possible to prove that sexual violence um, is systemic or could it be used in like a ethnic cleansing or genocide um, trial in the future? Sorry, that's kind of convoluted. I can clarify if needed. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, no, I don't think it's impossible. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are doing this documentation better than we are right now. So we're not the best folks to speak to that particular aspect. That being said, um, in principle, no, I don't, I don't believe that it is impossible, and I do believe that there are components of it that would, that do lend themselves to demonstrating widespread and systematic. It's been done before and it can be done um, in Ukraine. The challenges are, I mean, the, as you know, the challenges are so, are so many. Um, there's a lot of different perspectives that we can kind of take as investigators looking at units, looking at specific 
um, sort of conditioning that may be taking place among different actors, um, among the perpetrators, uh, looking at communication patterns. Um, there, yeah, I think that trying to be as creative as possible with the investigative techniques um, and data collection, that's going to be, I mean, that's going to be really crucial. I've talked a lot with uh, Lauren Wolf, who did a lot of this work previously in uh, Syria and other contexts uh, with UN Women. And so, there, yeah, but this is, this is the kind of thing where it's always important to keep in mind whether it's uh, gender-based violence and, se and sexual assault, um, a variant on that when it comes to targeted violence against queer communities. Um, there are so many things that often don't get sort of highlighted uh, for their potential to be documented by teams like ours, but absolutely can be. It's just not considered viewable, because it's not considered viewable via satellite, we don't always think of it first. And then it turns out to be something that you absolutely can map. Um, anything can be located in place and time. Uh, Ziad Ashkar from the Carter School. Um, we started this conversation today about how the field has evolved so far, and wanted to ask what is your perspective on where the next step is? What are the new potential capabilities where you hope the field um, is going to evolve to as a community of practice and research? That's a great question, and that was actually going to be my closing question, so good job on that. And we've got about five minutes left, so I definitely did not plan that with you, but I appreciate that. Um, Andrew, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, <clears throat> one important thing that we're going to be able to start doing by scaling is not responding to conflicts, but preemptively monitoring areas at risk of these kinds of crises. For early detection, early detection means we may be able, as an international community, we may be able to mitigate some of what happens. We might turn, um, you know, we, we wanna stop uh, the fire before it really gets started. And so I think that's, for us, that's a direction that we're looking at is how do we scale what we're doing in Ukraine to a worldwide human observer human observatory. Um, how do we do early detection of things that might be, you know, that might indicate something is happening and then we can leverage other assets to really understand what's happening there. To build on that, I think for us, we're right on the cusp of being able to do a little bit, I hate to use the word, but predictive modeling to help colleagues best understand what it is they should be putting efforts in towards protecting. You only have X number of sandbags. What are you going to protect, the monument or the church? And we're just at the edge of starting to be able to do that. And um, I think that as we keep going hopefully in the next year, I'll be able to say that we're being able to, to give some answers about where you should put resources to protect. Obviously, this is conflict dependent, uh, regional dependent, that sort of stuff. But um, I think that's, that's one big, big thing that we're, we're looking towards hopefully soon. Um, and then more broadly, cultural heritage in general is a relative newcomer in this space. Um, we, the big cultural heritage organizations still often think about satellites and the data associated with them as, here's a big, sexy picture from the sky. Uh, and uh, what, can, what can we do with this? And while that has its time and place, uh, it's, it's just the beginning, right? And, and so uh, trying to get um, sort of the larger cultural heritage community, the museum communities, uh, understanding what it is that can be done with this sort of data, I think is gonna be really, hopefully, the next big next big thing that happens. Um, I think this is something that we feel really challenged by all the time, right? You know, how, where is our next big evolution? Where does it need to go? Um, I tend to be a little less on the AI side, except in one area. And even there, it's very, I'm, I'm more of like Timnit Gebru on this one um, and Meredith Whitaker 
where I want to see it go low and slow and very, very intentional. Um, and that's mainly with language. Because everything we need to do needs to be about preservation of language and, and preservation of culture, and the destruction of those lang of languages is a very clear and intentional part of a lot of the things that we see happening. It's often actually one of the very earliest indicators that it is going on. Um, so, as we need, to, as we're doing our work better. I think one of the things that we also have to be mindful of is that we're not, it's also, this is also one of the things that we probably do the, the least well at, um, is making sure that our findings, our reports, um, the, as our colleague pointed out, the way we actually are talking about what we're doing and what we're finding, um, that we are putting it out in as many ways, in as many languages as it needs to be in, so that we can be having the conversation as fully as possible in real time and not constantly having to ask other people to come to us. Any comms professional will tell you that's not how you have a good conversation. You always go to your audience. Um, so how can we ask a lot of members of the Global South right now who are feeling very alienated, especially over Ukraine, um, you know, to come to the table when we literally aren't even providing the most basic aspects of, of you know, our reports and our, our key talking points. Um, in their languages. So these are some of the things where like, we just want to be a little bit more forward leaning, if only to start. Great, thank you so much to the three of you for sharing all of your insights, the experiences that you've had as part of the Conflict Observatory team over the past year. And so I will close by saying thank you, Catherine, thank you, Caitlin, and thank you, Andrew, for joining us. And thank you to the audience for the great questions and engagement. And uh, we will close out the panel now. Thanks. Thank you.